show for you today called Lost in Science. The show is brought out from Swinburne University. We're supported by the Swinburne Department of Science, Engineering and Design. And during the show we've brought lots of different items relating to fairly practical science to show you and for you to get involved in. Now during the show we're going to ask lots of questions. We need you to think about what we're showing you, answer questions for us and give us your ideas. And we also need people to come out and volunteer and work with us on some of the items that we're showing you. Okay, my name is Kate. Also presenting, we have Glenda and Michael. And making a video of the show, we have Geraldine. All right, now we're going to open the show with a video that was produced at Swinburne. A rap video, lots of science images, called Science Is. science and I want to introduce you to our first item which is over here we call it a Jacob's Ladder I'll show you why in a minute but I'll, I'll explain to you what it's what it's actually um, what it's made of it's we have two copper rods coming out of the top of a transformer now this transformer is converting normal everyday 240 volts into 15,000 volts of electricity so we've got 15,000 volts coming out of this now watch what happens when we turn it on Okay, what, what do we have jumping between the two copper rods there? Who knows? What is it? It's a, an electrical arc. It's a spark, right? Now, as Kate does it again, 
I want you to notice where the arc starts jumping across. Sorry, someone said it? Does it start jumping across at the top or the bottom? Yes, it starts jumping across at the bottom. Now, the question is, if we, if we have an electrical arc jumping across at the bottom, why doesn't it stay there? Why does it rise up? But then, why doesn't it stay there? Does anyone have any ideas? Yes? Would you like to? Yes. Okay. Now, I'll give you a hint. What do you think is hap what do you think is happening to the air around that electrical arc? Sorry. Yes, it's getting hot. And what does what does warm air do when it gets hot? That's right. So I know you can guess what's happening. The electrical arc is actually rising up on the current of warm air until the gap between the two points on the copper rods is too far for it to jump over and it starts at the bottom. Now I'll tell you something about electricity. Electricity is very lazy and it's always going to find the two shortest points to jump across and that's why it starts at the bottom. Now, what natural phenomenon does this remind you of? Where have you seen this happen in nature? Say again? What about when it rains and there's thunder? Lightning, yes, this is like lightning. And lightning, like the Jacob's Ladder, is lazy and it will find the shortest point to Earth. Whether that point is the top of the tallest pine tree in a forest or the tip of your umbrella when you're walking across an oval in a thunderstorm. Now, not many people have survived being struck by lightning because when it strikes you, the point at which it strikes is supposed to be as hot as the surface of the sun. But there is the anecdote of one uh, American park ranger who was struck by lightning nine times. And he survived. Although he lost his eyebrows, he lost his fingernails and a few other bits and pieces. <laughs> and he, he is no longer a park ranger. But that goes to show that someone can be struck by lightning and survive the experience. So that was Jacob's Ladder. Glenda. Thanks, Michael. I need a volunteer for this item. Would you like to come out? What's your name? Nick. Nick, I'd like you to introduce you to Jaws. Now, Jaws over here is a very vicious shark and I want you to perform a trick. Watch very carefully. I want you to pass this rod down between Jaws' tonsils. But you've got to be careful. Can you see what I'm doing? Just down between those two bars. You've got to be careful because if you tickle his tonsils, he might bite. Okay? Do you think you can do that? Okay. Off you go, Nick. Uh oh. Uh oh. <laughs> Sorry, Nick. Pull, pull hard. Okay, try again. Try not to get his tonsils this time. It makes him very angry. <laughs> Maybe you're using the wrong end. Did I use the other end before? Let's see what happens. <laughs> Nick, I hope you know how to tangle with a real shark. Okay, Nick, you can have a badge for being our volunteer. <laughs> the feet. Have we got someone else who thinks they can? Would you like to come out? Now what's your name? Eliza. Do you think you can tickle the tonsils of our jaws without getting chomped? Very good Eliza. Not a problem. Do it again show everyone how easily you can do it. Well done. Now, actually, I didn't mention before, this was actually part of a scientific uh, experiment to see whether girls were stronger than boys or not, more coordinated. And I think we've just proved that Eliza is more coordinated than Nick, haven't we? <laughs> haven't we? No? No, I don't seem very convinced here. Thank you, Eliza. Just a moment. You can have a badge too. Okay. Some of you don't seem very convinced by this demonstration. What was the problem? <laughs> what did we turn on? Maybe someone put their hand up and explain to me exactly what we were doing here. Yes, up the back there. 
Oh, very good. Yes, we did in fact have an electromagnet here. And you can see there, Kate's got the switch that turns it on and off. Now, this another name for this is a temporary magnet. Now, we have other, we're used to other sorts of magnets that stick on our fridge. Do you, does anyone know what the name of those sort of magnets is? <laughs> fridge magnets, yes, okay. If this is a temporary magnet though, what might we call the ones that stick on the fridge all the time and can't be turned off? <laughs> Permanent magnets, that's right. Now, where could we use something, that, uh, an electromagnet that we can turn on and off? What sort of use would that be? Can anyone think how we might use such a thing? I'm sure you've been able to see them somewhere. No one's ever heard? They're actually used in car yards and I'll show you how. Well, Kate will demonstrate how they're sometimes used in wrecking car, wreckers' yards where they've got a, an old bomb and they come along with a crane with an electromagnet on the end and they switch on the electromagnet and the car gets lifted up and then the crane moves it to the pile where it's got to be dumped or whatever and they turn the electromagnet off. Now, in this instance, it doesn't drop off immediately because there's a bit of residual magnetism. I mean, if we give it a little push, it, it comes off easily. Also, another place, you've probably got quite a few electromagnets in your appliances at home. Things like washing machines and dishwashers and tumble dryers use electromagnets to switch the programs on and off. So, your electromagnets in your appliances at home. Okay, the next thing I'd like you to look at is over by the side there and uh, Glenda might just do a little bit of a juggling trick for us. What we've got is a couple of white pipes that are connected to the air outflow from a vacuum cleaner motor. In other words, it's blowing air out. And Glenda's juggling those pieces of foam, those spheres, in the blowing out air. Why do they stay there? They're not attached by anything. Why don't they just shoot off? Why are they just staying in that one spot? Ideas. Yep. Alright, so you think the air is going up and then spreading around them? Okay, and holding them there. Alright, so there's a balance being achieved between the air that's blowing up from underneath and the air that's holding them down. What do we call it, that force that we get from the air? Gravity is a force that we get from the earth. There's a force that we get from the air. Do you know? Air pressure is what we're talking about. We're talking about the air pressing on those spheres and stopping them from flying off. We'll discuss a little bit further after we've shown you the next demonstration. Glenda's connected a bit of hose now to this blowing out air and a funnel. And she's going to see if she can hold a big pump in the funnel. That's fine. You can even hold it upside down and it stays there. And don't forget the air is blowing out, but the pink pump wall is staying in the neck of the funnel. Somebody like to try and explain that to me? So you think it's actually jammed into the funnel. Just show Glenda that if you don't have the air blowing out, it won't stay there. It will just drop out. Okay, so it's not because it's wedged in place and there's air blowing out through. Would you like to explain it? No? The hand went down very quickly. All right. Well, let's just talk about it in terms of the air. When the air is blowing out, it's moving quickly. Fast moving air actually exerts less pressure. So it's a low pressure of air that's coming out, even though it's moving quickly. Then as it splits and goes around the ball or around the spheres, it has to go a bit further. And when it comes around to the top, it's going slower. And slower moving air exerts more pressure. So when the air's moving slowly, it's pressing down on the spheres or on the ping pong ball compared to where it was going fast and exerting a little bit of pressure. All right, we'll just have a, a think about where we can use that. Where can the difference in air pressure between fast and slow moving air be used to help us? Yep. Okay, vacuum cleaners is a good one. What about um, 
What makes an aeroplane fly? Alright, first answer is an engine, but my car's got an engine and it doesn't fly. So you need more than an engine, don't you? Yeah? Wings help a lot. That's right. Now how do wings work? Does anybody know how wings work? <laughs> Alright, there's the kind that you can flap and then there's the kind that aeroplanes have. Okay, alright. Alright, so let's just have a look at a model of an aeroplane wing. We've, we've brought along something that's just like the cross section of an aeroplane wing. And you'll see that it's flat along the bottom surface and curved along the top surface. Now if you can imagine that there's a stream of air passing across that wing, it has to go further to get across the top. So it goes faster in order to meet up with the other air coming from underneath. Faster moving air has less or more pressure. Fast moving air has less pressure. So the top has less air pressure on it than the bottom does. So the wing gets pushed up and the plane can fly. It's called lift and it's something that was investigated by a scientist called Bernoulli who's been responsible for a lot of the ideas that gave us flight and aerodynamics. Racing cars have the reverse kind of design on the back. Have you seen a spoiler on a racing car? They're designed in the opposite way so that the racing car will be held down to the ground. Okay. Michael. Thank you, folks. Uh, for the next item, we're going to dabble a little bit in psychology, and I want you to focus on the monitors. What we're going to do is we're going to flash a brief message on the screen, and I want you to read it. It'll only appear very briefly. I want you to read it and remember it, because I want you to tell me what it says. Okay, did, did you all read that? Yes. Who can tell me what it said? Yes. Harrison Spring. Okay, now. Did anyone read anything else? Paris in the Spring? Yes. Yes? Anyone else? Did anyone read anything apart from Paris in the Spring or Paris and Spring? Yes. You saw two these. Well, that's interesting. Okay. Can we read one to show what it did actually say? Okay. That's what the message actually said. Paris in the, the spring. And I confess, when I first saw that message, I thought it said Paris in the spring as well. But it's interesting how we tended not to see the second the. You see, when you look at a message like that, you, see, you not only see it with your eyes, but you interpret it with your brain. And the brain is going to interpret that something so it makes sense, even if it means deleting a word in a sentence that you see, just so that it'll make sense to you. Now that's one thing. The other thing, of course, is that by now you all read so fluently that you don't bother with the little words like the or a. You just read to make sense of what you read, and so you miss out those kind of words. Now, the next, the next demonstration I want to show you is a lot of cubes. And... We, okay, now I want you to look at this image, and I want you to tell me how many cubes you can see. I want you to count them. Yes, how many do you see? You see six. Yes. You see seven. Okay, we're having a difference of opinion. Yes, you, Jill in the bank. How many do you see? You see ten. We, we don't really have a consensus here. Okay. I, we have some disagreement, right? So, what we're going to do... Listen, listen, this is what we want to do. If you're looking at one monitor, I want you to look at the other monitor because we're going to invert the image, okay? And I want you to tell me if if you see the same number of cues, cubes you saw the first time. Was that different? Do you notice a different number this time? Okay, let me explain to you what's happening. We're, we're showing you an image. 
We're showing you an image, okay, that is confusing to the brain because it is a three-dimensional image that we've presented in a two-dimensional format and your brain can't make up your mind whether it's seeing six or seven. Sometimes it sees six, sometimes it sees seven. We just... And that's all because you behold something with your eyes but your brain tries to make sense of it. Now, does anyone know what these things are called? Yes, they're called optical illusions. Now, I want you to have a look at our next item. This will finish in just a second or two. Now this is interesting. Do you think the triangle is in front of or behind the glass? You think it's behind? Okay. Okay, we have Alright, let's let's see what happens. Let's 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 play the video. the video. Does anyone have a theory about what's happening here? Yes. It's a gap and you don't think it's a closed triangle? Yes. The same. Okay, well, we're going to play the video and we're going to show you how we created this optical illusion. Jackie was right, it wasn't a proper triangle, it wasn't a closed triangle. In fact, when you saw a revolt turning around, one arm was actually longer than the other arm. Now, it was easy to create this optical illusion because it was a 3D image, and we presented it on a, t on a flat TV screen, and you didn't get to see the secondary cues. You didn't get to look around it. You didn't have the benefit of shadow or, or depth of field or things like that that would help you explain the optical illusion. Okay, now... Finally, I want to show you another image that I hope is familiar to you. Okay. Now, you all know who this is. This is Lady Di, and you can see that she's upside down. But is there something, is there something still peculiar about her face? <laughs> Okay, now the face is kind of recognizable this way, even though it's upside down. We're just going to show the next image now where the face is right way up. Yeah, you see the first time the eyes and the mouth were the right way up, even though the face was upside down. This time it's the eyes and the mouth that are upside down and it looks a little more peculiar and some people have a little more trouble recognizing it because when you talk to someone, what do you notice about their face? You notice their eyes, and you notice their mouth. And that's why it's harder to recognize the second time, or why some people find it harder to recognize, because it is the mouth and the eyes that were changed. And that's the face put together properly. Okay. Linda. Right, I'm going to tell you a story once I've disentangled myself. I want you to all imagine that you're out driving with your parents in the country on a really dark, stormy night. And you're miles from anywhere and suddenly the car gives a cup cough and a splutter and it pulls to a halt. This is a case for the RACV. Well, you all look around the car, looking at each other, saying, well, who's going to go for help? And guess what? You're chosen. In the distance, you see a light on the hill, and you think, aha, there must be a farmhouse or something up there. So you head off towards this house on the hill. But as you get close to it, you discover it's not a farmhouse at all. It's sort of like a weird castle. 
feeling a little bit nervous, you knock on the great big door, but nobody answers. But the door creaks open, and so you think, well, this is my only chance to uh, get help, so I better go in. So you go inside, walk down the deserted corridor going, anybody home? Anybody home? But no one answers. And you walk into the first room you find, and uh, yes, there was a phone on the wall. Fantastic. But just as you're about to reach for the receiver, you find, see something out of the corner of your eye moving. And you notice that on the bench in the corner, there's a body. And it's shrouded in a sheet. And uh, it starts to move. Guess whose place you have found? It's Dr. Frankenstein. And it's this monster on the slab. Right. And as he, as he gets up, he says, I'm thirsty. Well, he looks pretty aggressive and you want to keep him happy so he can make the phone call in peace. So um, you look around wildly around this, what turns out to be a laboratory, and uh, there's some beakers, what looks like water. So you pick up one of the beakers and you say, here, Frankie, want a, want a glass of water? No, don't like water. Well, they all seem to be water, but maybe we can make something else. Aha, uh -huh, we've managed to make some monster juice. But no, Frankie said, I had that for breakfast. No, I don't want that. Oh well, uh, let's try again. See what else we can make. Maybe we can make some milk. And do you know what? Frankie seems pretty happy with the milk and he gulps it all down. Now what happens if you drink too much cold milk? Sometimes you get a headache, sometimes, sometimes, sometimes something else starts to hurt. Stomach ache, okay. And what do you take for a stomach ache? Aspirin, Panadol, maybe some Eno or something like that. Let's see what we can produce. Okay, a nice fizzy drink. Well, you give that to Frankie and he drinks that down. And he feels so much better that he lies down and goes back to sleep. And you're able to make your phone call to the RACV and you're the hero of the family. Okay. need a volunteer for the next item and I need somebody who's got heaps of energy to share with us. Okay, would you like to come out? Oh, hang on, hang on. No, you've got double vision. It was you. Put your hand up again next time, sorry. Alright, what's your name? Sorry? Laura. Laura, okay. Alright, Laura. You're going to work over here with Glenda for the moment. Do you ride a bike? Yep, so you know how to do a bike pump? Yep, good, because we're going to put some of your energy to work pumping up the, with the bike pump. We've got a piece of apparatus there, which we call Thumper, for reasons which will become obvious. It's designed to have two compartments to it. It's got cylindrical compartments, which are connected by an O-ring, and they can move through each other. And there's a piston down at the bottom, which is connected to the, the compartments. We're going to get Laura to use the bike pump, or take turns with Glenda to use the bike pump, to put air into the two separate cylinders of this piece of apparatus. Just a low pressure of air in the lower cylinder, but in the upper cylinder, we want the air to be under high pressure. So Laura's going to have to do lots and lots of work with the bike pump. She has to get around to the mark with the red dot on it, the 400 kilopascal mark. Now the first couple of hundred are not so bad, but it gets a bit harder. So what we're doing is getting Laura to do some work, which we will then transform into another kind of energy that we can use. This particular piece of apparatus is a model of something that's used in heavy industry, probably don't use a bike pump to pump it up, but still. Okay, now we've got 400 kilopascals in the top cylinder, 200 kilopascals in the lower cylinder. Underneath the piston that's attached at the bottom, we have a little lead slug. And we're going to see what happens when we release the air so that the cylinders can move. All right, we'll turn the tap, let the air out.
and almost nothing <laughs> happened. A very quiet little pump. All right, now that was not the expected result at all. We'll get um, the, the piston moved up a little bit, just another little burst of air into the lower cylinder. We'll lift the piston back up and we'll see whether we've made any impact on our lead slug. Now when you look at it, you can see the original lead slug, which looks like a little old-fashioned haystack, and the squashed one next to it. It was a very quiet impact, but it squashed that lead slug down to less than a third of its size. Thank you, Laura. Not too hard work? Good. All right, that was very well done. Okay, now that process of just using a little bit of work to generate some air pressure to make an enormous difference in a piece of metal is called explosive forming. And it's used in a lot of parts of industry where there are pieces of metal to be joined or shaped that can't be done easily by any other method, that can't be done easily by casting or welding or cutting. And explosive forming is how they make the fuselages of aeroplanes, it's how they do a lot of um, pressed joins in heavy pieces of machinery. Okay, Michael. Okay, thank you. Um, our next item has to do with some great inventions of our time. Uh, has anyone here ever invented something? Okay. Well, have you ever wondered why some things like the biro or the can opener were invented? It was because there was like a practical problem that needed to be solved and someone put their mind to it and came up with a creative solution to the problem. Now, the Science Teachers Association often does a talent search and it goes around to schools like this to discover if any of you, any of your peers or anyone in year seven and eight has come up with a clever invention. Now, last year the Science Teachers Association discovered a particularly clever invention that was developed by a young man called Heath Keeley from St. Joseph's in Echuca. Now, we were so impressed with Heath's invention that we brought it to the show to demonstrate to you. Now, the practical problem that Heath faced was there were many apples in his mother's kitchen that needed to be quartered and cored. And it was kind of a laborious thing to have to cut these all afternoon, so he thought about it and he came up with a solution. He designed and developed his apple corer, which is this hollow aluminium tube with the four fins on it. Now the four fins are actually blades, okay? Now, to demonstrate this, I'd like a volunteer to come up and, and show us how it works. Yes, Jody, would you like to come up? Just go there behind there with Kate and Kate will show you how to operate the apple corer. Okay, and as you can see, it's quite, it has efficiently and cleanly quartered the apple. Now, Jody, stay there. Where is the core? That's right, it's down there. Okay, now he thought about this too, and he sort of amended his invention, and he developed this little stand here to remove the apple corer. Would you like to demonstrate how it works? Okay, great. Thanks very much, Jody. And here's a badge for demonstrating Heath Keeley's apple corer. Okay, well, that was just one example of some of the inventions that your peers have developed, and we wanted to bring it in to show you, to perhaps inspire you to do something like what Heath Keeley did in solving a practical problem in a very creative way. Right, I'd like you to uh, turn your attention over this way. We have a spinning wheel, which we'll turn around in a moment. And I want you to help me solve three problems that we have. Now, this spinning wheel is going to be going for the length of the item. So we're not going to be turning it off. We can't slow it down. It's got one fixed speed. It's actually an old washing machine motor. Um, I want you to help me find out what's on the wheel, what direction it's spinning, and how fast it's going. 
Now, can anyone think of ways we can solve some of those problems? Yes. A strobe light. Okay. Does anyone know what a strobe light is? Oh, I'll explain what it is. Okay, yes, it's a light that flashes at a set speed. And in fact, that will solve one of our problems. We have a light like that, that we've brought along. You might have seen these at discos or something like that. They flash very fast. Okay, let's see what happens if we put it on our wheel. Because we can't turn the lights off very much here, we, we're not getting a great effect. But you can see that we can now work out what is on the wheel. So we've solved one of the problems already. Can anyone explain to me why that strobe light makes the, the wheel visible, or the, what's on the wheel visible? Yes. Okay, the light flashes on every time the wheel's in the one position. Okay, so there's one spin of the wheel for every flash of the light. Right, so that might help us solve our, another of our problems, and that is how fast it's spinning. Now, if we knew how fast the light was flashing, we might be able to work out how fast the wheel is spinning. How fast is the light flashing? The light is flashing 24 times a second. 24 times a second. So how fast is the wheel spinning around? Someone put up their hand. I can't hear. Yes? Pardon? 24 times a second? Yes, that's right. Okay. Well done. Now we've still got one problem, it's actually the easiest one, of which way is the wheel turning? We can actually make it look like it's going either way by adjusting the, the strobe light. We can make it look like it's spinning clockwise or anti-clockwise. So that's not going to help us. Who can think of a, a simple way of telling which way the wheel is spinning? Yes? You think it's going anti-clockwise? Okay, that's an opinion. How can we test that? Yes? No, you've forgotten. Everyone's getting ideas and losing them again, yeah? Uh, yeah, I like all my fingers though, I don't want to lose one. Well, how would you test it? Okay, um, it's a bit dangerous actually touching it. We could turn it off, that would tell us too as it slowed down, but we're going to keep it going. Can anyone think of a way? Um, that could be confusing too, yes? Pardon? Put a stick near it. What would that tell us? Good, so we need to put something near it, yes? Speak up loud, I can. Watch the centre. That can be deceiving though. Yes? What would you put down the side of it? A bit of sticky tape. <laughs> Throw things at it, yeah? Okay, would you like to come out and try that? That sounds like a good idea to me, come on. Go on. <laughs> What's your name? We, well, you might be able to feel the wind, but you won't be able to show everyone. So we've got some little bits of paper there. If you go behind there with Michael and hold some paper up, everyone will be able to see which way the wind is blowing. Okay, what way does the paper seem to be going there? Upwards, right. Hold it on the top there, Fleur. And now it seems to be going to the left. And hold it down the other side. It's going down. So we think the wheel must be going anti-clockwise. Okay, thank you very much, Fleur. You can have a badge for helping out. It's a brilliant idea. Very simple, but... Okay, so we've solved all three of our problems with our wheel. Now, those strobe lights that we looked at earlier are also used in industry. Uh, sometimes if large machines need to be inspected, rather than turn them off and shut the factory down, they use strobe lights to look at them while they're going around so they can check if any nuts and bolts are loose or whatever. And also motor mechanics use them 
If you've ever seen a motor mechanic use what they call a timing light, and it helps them check the speed of the engine, and they can tell whether their engine's going at the right rate or not. All right. For several years now, Swinburne University's Department of Engineering has run a competition for their first year students to get them involved in some principles of designing equipment. And the competition that they designed was to make a rubber band powered racing vehicle. All right, now that's been a traditional thing for the university students to do. And for the last few years, it's been accessible to school students as a competition that we've been running. And we've got uh, a videotape of last year's competition entries. These were vehicles that had to be built to be powered only by a single rubber band. And in this particular case, they had to run around on a circular track. And we were looking for the one that could get the greatest distance. So it was an endurance race, not a speed race. All right, now we'll just have a look uh, quietly at some of these racer attempts from last year. And while we're doing that, we'll have a little think about what are the important qualities of a vehicle that's going to be powered by a rubber band. Now, if that's all you've got for a source of energy, what does your vehicle have to be? Any ideas of how you can describe it? Okay, two things immediately. It's got to be wound up so that we can store energy in the rubber band. It's got to be light. Anything else? All right, they're pretty important factors. And then apart from that, you have to consider other factors that make a vehicle work. You've got to consider things like traction on the road, which we usually get from rubber tires. You have to consider whether it can steer or go straight. Or in this case, go around in a circle and go a really, really long distance, almost make it back around to the start again. Okay, we've got a vehicle, a rubber band powered vehicle. Looks like a very sophisticated tricycle. All right, now Deb is going to put some energy into our rubber band vehicle. By stretching the rubber band, hooking it onto the back axle, and winding it up to store energy in it. And while she's doing that, you can have a look at that vehicle. You can see that it's made from light plastic, which has been drilled out to make it even lighter. It's got very fine rubber tires on it so that it will grip to the floor. The metal used to provide most of the body is aluminium because aluminium is very light and just a very flimsy piece of plastic for a front wheel. Now we're going to give this one a race just across the front of the room but we'll, we'll uh, give you the view of that on the monitor so that you can see it. Those people near the front may see it travel across the front. Now it's going on carpet so it probably won't go terribly far. Ready? went out the door. That was an extremely good run. Okay, it's actually quite fun designing and modifying a vehicle like that. So if you want to get involved next year in a competition like that, the school will be notified when Swinburne runs its next competition. Thank you. Michael. Okay, I want to talk to you now about alternative forms of energy. Have you studied alternative forms of energy? Yeah in your geography subject. Now you know that there are some forms of energy that are called non-renewable because once they're used, they can't be used again, such as coal or natural gas. Now they're the most common forms of uh, sources of energy that are used to create electricity. Can anyone think of any other forms of energy that can be used to create electricity? Yes. Wind. Wind power. Yes, that's a good example. Solar power. Solar power, yes, I like that. Anyone else? Yes. Water, hydroelectricity. Yeah, that's good. Wood. Wood is, I guess it's non-renewable because once you've cut down a tree and burned it to create energy, then you've got to either plant more trees and, and, and then cut them down as well. But there's a limit to that. Let's look at solar power because we have the energy of the sun that is a constant source of energy. And we have a model of a solar-powered house over here. And we want to demonstrate to you how the sun can be used to run household appliances. 
Now, we don't have the sun. We actually have a very powerful electric light. And when Kate turns it on, I want to show you how we can use it to run a radio. Okay, so we can use that to power the radio. Now, as you can see, if Kate's hand is a cloud, and it sort of obstructs the light getting to the solar cells, we have a bit of a problem. Okay. Now, another thing that we can use to run, to run off the solar powered cells is we have a little model shower. And we have a little model of a farmer, Bart Simpson, who hops into the shower. And we're now going to turn that shower and see if the solar cells can operate the shower, which they do. Now, Bart is enjoying his shower there, but now Bart has a cat, which can be a nuisance because it likes, it likes basking on those warm solar cells, which get very, very hot. And of course, that cuts off the power and the water stops running. So, how do we solve the problem? Yes, we have to do something about the cat. We could take the cat gently off the roof and put the cat down and it returns power to the shower and it's running. Okay, now, you see we've got a practical problem with solar energy. If you have something that obstructs the, uh, the sunlight getting to the solar cells, it's going to temporarily cut your power source. So we need to learn how to sort, sorry, uh, store that energy in some form. Can anyone think of a way of storing that solar energy? Yes. In a battery, exactly. That is the practical solution to the problem of, of solar panels, which are very uh, unpredictable and dependent upon weather conditions to use a battery. Okay. Right, we're going to have a little look at a laser light now. We've got a, a laser over here, which we might move the side from. Right, now, does anyone know what LASER stands for? It's actually a, an acronym, which means that every letter of the word LASER stands for a different word. So, what might the L stand for? Light, okay, we've got the first one. It's actually for light amplification by the stimulated emission of radiation. So as you can see, it's much easier to say the word laser. Now, who knows where we can use lasers? Yes. Zone three, okay, games. Where else can we use them? Say it again. Can't hear you. In a movie, yeah, okay. In real life, where have you seen them? House alarms? Um, not sure if their lasers are infrareds. CDs, yes, CDs use lasers to read them. Also, if you go into a supermarket, what do they do to um, find the price of your item? Yeah, they use a laser scanner. Right, as you can see, we've got a little laser shine. We've reflected it onto the whiteboard at the back. Now, how might this laser light differ from, a, say, a torch light? Can anyone think? Yes? Okay. It stays in a really tight spot, not like a torch light which tends to spread out. It's called coherent light because it doesn't spread out. And that's what makes it very good for things like gun sights and they also use it for surveying. It stays in a nice tight little point. Another thing, something different from a torch light. Yes? You can see the beam in a torch light. Yep, you can't see the beam here unless we fill the air with something that might reflect it and uh, we'll put a bit of artificial smoke through here and we might be able to see the beam. You can see it just between the, the mirror and the, the laser. Yes, we're going to um, make all the people at the front here choke if we put too much smoke in the air. Right, that's two differences. Yes, if we put powder it would do the same thing. What colour is a torchlight usually? Yellow. 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 
yellow usually for a normal torchlight. This one is red. Not because we've put a bit of red cellophane in front of it, because, but because it's the type of laser it is that produces a red light. So there are three differences that lasers produce, different from uh, torchlights. Now, we can do some interesting things with lasers. We can bend it round corners, because light bends round corners, doesn't it? Yes? It doesn't really, but if we put a perspex S here, we can actually get the laser to go around those corners. Now, how can we make a light bend, do you think? Yes, up the, over on the other side? Refraction. Uh, in this case, it's not refraction, it's something similar though. It's actually reflection. It's called total internal reflection. What happens is the beam could travel straight until it hits one of the internal walls of the S and then it reflects off and it keeps on bouncing around the inside of that S until it gets to the end. You can see the light coming out the end. Now this is the same way that optical fibres use light, laser light. And we've got a little sample of optical fibre that we're going to plug in. And you see we can bend it into any shape. We can even tie knots in it and the light still travels around the optical fibres. This is how things like telephone calls and the like are transmitted from one city to another using laser light in optical fibres. Thanks. Okay, I'm going to need a volunteer to come out and help. Okay, would you like to come out? Yes, you. Brent. Okay, Brent, we're going to get you to do some exercise. Alright? We've got some exercise weights here. But you can sit down while you're doing it, alright? So sit down on the stool, put your feet up, tuck them up, that's right, and I'll get Glenda to give you some exercise weights to hold on to. Now they're quite heavy. Okay, got a grip on them? All right, Brent, what I want you to do by way of exercise is to put your arms out straight like a scarecrow. Two arms out straight, good. And then drop them down by your side. Up. Down. Good. You can follow instructions. I won't wear you out before we get started on this. All right, now the point of giving Brent those weights was to change the distribution of his weight significantly. When he has his arms out wide, the ends of his arms are going to be very heavy. And when he puts his arms by his side, he's going to be a very heavy person down through the centre. Okay, Brent, you're going to be spun around now. Is that okay? Don't mind being a bit dizzy? Arms up. Down. Up. Down. Leave them down for a moment. Leave them down for a bit. Now put them up. And down once more. And then I think we might stop him before he gets too dizzy. Well done, Brent. Didn't fall over, didn't uh, get too dizzy at all. I'll give you a badge for doing that. Thank you. What did you notice about Brent when he moved his hands from up to down? Yes? Yes, you? He went faster when his arms were down. He went faster when his weight was concentrated right down through the centre, right down through the centre of the spinning platform. And when he spread his weight out across a wide distance, then he went slower. There's a sport which uses this principle to govern the speed at which people spin. Ice skating, that's right, if you watch ice skaters, when they want to do a fast spin, they make sure that all their body weight is right down through the centre and when they want to slow down or come out of a spin they spread their weight, they use their arms and legs to spread their weight out. Alright, I need another volunteer to come out and have a go on this too. Would you like to come out? Okay, what's your name? Do you ride a bike? Good. 
but we've got a, a piece of bike here. We couldn't fit it all in the truck, so we only brought the front wheel and the handlebars, so we'll just make do with that. If you can go over with Glenda, you get to sit on the stool too. All right, and you can tuck your feet up on the platform of the, the stool, that's right. And hang on to the bike wheel, okay, that's great. Um, can you hold your arms out really straight in front of you? That's right. Now see what happens if you put your right hand down and your left arm over so that you're twisting the wheel over horizontal. Good. Nothing's happening there, is it? Try turning it the other way. Nothing's happening. Why is nothing happening? You wouldn't expect anything to happen? All right. What would happen if you were on a bike and the wheels were totally still like that? Oh, I'm glad to see you. You're familiar with that. That's right. If you're on a bike and the wheels aren't moving, you'll fall off. It'll fall over. So we will spin this wheel up so that it has got some movement in it. Then Glenda to put some of her energy to use. And then she'll give the wheel back to Brooke. Now hold it out straight, Brooke. And now steer again. Put your one arm over the other. That's right. Excellent. Try going the other way. Okay, and you're going back the other way. Keep going. You can steer again. Now what we've done is... That's not a bad ride, is it, Brooke? Might be able to control your direction terribly well, but that's quite good. Okay, well done. That's it. Quite tough to hold on to that. Thanks, Brooke. Okay. When the wheel is spinning, when the bicycle wheel is spinning, it has a force called angular momentum. Which means that the bicycle wheel continues to move on in this line along which it's going. And when, when Brooke was holding the spinning wheel and turning it, then there was a force coming from the wheel, but she was holding the wheel tight. So in fact, the force was being transferred down and operating through the spinning platform instead. All right, so it was just a matter of some opposing forces going into play there. All right, Michael. Thanks, Kate. Now, from physics, we're going to go to chemistry. I want to show you a particular kind of chemical reaction. We have over here um, a chemical bath. What you can see is the word fade. Fade is written on a template that has been put next to this chemical bath. We can show you that it's a template by removing it. And in there, we have this bluish, purplish liquid. Now, we want to demonstrate a photochemical reaction. Do any of you know what a photochemical reaction implies? It means that we can create an impression on the water. We can create a chemical reaction with the use of light. Now, I've put the template there in front of the, uh, the bath of chemicals. And Kate is now going to pass a very high-powered light in the front of it. And we're going to see if we can create a chemical reaction. Okay, can some of you see that? Can you see how it has left an impression in the water? When she moves the bath, you can see the words waving there in the water because it's an impression in the chemical. Okay, now, this has some very interesting applications and I'm wondering if anyone knows where photochemical reactions um, occur or where they're used. And I'll give you a clue. There is one lady in the room who is holding something that involves a photochemical reaction. Yes, a camera, exactly. When a camera shutter opens and the image and the image impresses itself on the photographic film. The photographic film has chemicals on it. And in the same way that you saw the word fade impressed itself on the liquid, the image that the camera sees is impressed on the photographic film because of the chemicals on the photographic paper. When you then go to develop it, it goes through a similar process where some more chemicals convert that negative image into a photograph. So, that was just to demonstrate how photo, a photochemical reaction is used in photography to create the kinds of images that you, that you know so well. Linda. Right, who likes to go to birthday parties? Right, everyone likes a party. What's one of the important things you always need at a party? Okay, food's one of them. I can't hear anyone. 
everyone's reaction. So if you can put your hand up, I'll be able to hear. A cake's important. Food. Food. Presents. So I was thinking more of the decorations and things like that. What do you often have? Balloons. Yes, everyone needs balloons at parties. That's right. Now, uh, quite like holding parties um, and but I get really sick of blowing up the balloons every time and it seems such a waste because once you've blown up the balloons and the party's over you just have to burst them all and next time you have to blow them up all over again and uh, I was wondering if there was a way to get over this problem so I mentioned it at Swinburne and they said yes yeah, sure we can cure this problem we'll give you this canister to store your balloons in, in between parties. So I've got this silver canister and every time I have a party, we just take the lid off and pull out the balloons and give them a shake for a while and presto, we have our balloons. And then when we're finished, we pop them back in again and save them for the next party. Isn't that great? Does anyone know what might be in this canister? Yes? Liquid nitrogen, very good. Okay, now there seems to be sort of steam coming off it. Is it steam, do you think? Is it hot or cold in there, do you think? Cold. Some people say hot, some people say cold. It's actually very cold. Liquid nitrogen is almost minus 200 degrees Celsius. So you can imagine that that is very, very cold. Your freezer at home is only about minus 40 degrees. So this is much colder than a freezer. We're going to get Michael to pour some of it out of the canister into a beaker and uh, you can have a look at some of this liquid nitrogen. Now it looks, gives a great spooky effect. In fact, it's sometimes used as special effects in movies and that. Anyone seen Terminator 2? Yeah. I think 